Deux minutes, deux minutes. Il a fallu, il a fallu Hello and welcome to the National Press Theatre. Bonjour et bienvenue au Théâtre National de la Presse. I'm Elizabeth Thompson with CBC News. With us today, given that pot is now legal in Canada, uh, we have four cabinet ministers to explain it all to us. Uh, Mr. Bill Blair, Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction. Uh, Mr. Ralph Goodale, uh, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Uh, Ms. Jody Wilson-Raybould, Minister of Justice. And uh, the Jeanette Pettipot-Taylor, Minister of Health. Uh, they, they will be making statements followed by questions. It will be one question, one follow-up, and I am going to be strict because there are a lot of people and not much time. Mr. Blair. Thank you very much, and, and good morning, everyone, and I'd like to say thank you very much for being here this morning, and I'd like to begin, of course, by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. I am pleased to be here with you all this morning and joined by my colleagues, Minister Pettipot taylor Minister Wilson-Raybould, and Minister Goodall, uh, to mark the coming into force of the Cannabis Act. Today, our government has delivered on our promise to legalize, strictly regulate, and restrict access to cannabis in order to better keep cannabis out of the hands of our youth and to keep profits away from criminals. We know from experience that the criminal prohibition that was in effect for a century in this country has failed our kids and our communities. It has led to a situation in which our children use cannabis currently at the highest rate of any country in the world, and additionally, we also know that the current uh, 
up until today, the market for uh, cannabis was entirely controlled by organized crime in its production and its, and its distribution. And that has resulted in literally billions of dollars in profit going to illicit organized crime and putting our kids in jeopardy. We also know that according to Statistics Canada, more than 4 million Canadians over the age of 15 have said that they have used cannabis in the first quarter of 2018. And under that system, uh, that failed system of, of criminal sanction for, for cannabis production and distribution, we have created a situation whereby the cannabis that our kids and Canadian adults are consuming is unregulated, untested, and unsafe. The production and distribution of, 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 of cannabis need to be brought under control, and that is why we have brought forward a, a new strong regulatory framework, one which is based upon a public health framework, a model which is intended to reduce the health and social harms of cannabis use. We are not merely legalizing it. You cannot, to, you cannot regulate a prohibited substance. So we are lifting the prohibition, that's what legalization is, to enable us to implement a comprehensive and far more effective system of strict regulatory control that will bring the regulatory control and order to every aspect of the production, distribution, and consumption of cannabis. As I have said, our approach is centered on protecting youth. Up until yesterday, if a police officer encountered a child in, in possession of a, of a joint, the, the police officer had only two options, to do nothing or to lay a criminal charge. The consequences of that criminal charge and a criminal conviction could have lifelong consequences for that youngster. And today, as a result of the new regulatory framework that we have brought in, the work that we have done with the provinces and territories, today in every jurisdiction, in every province and territory, police have a new authority. The police can now seize that drug. They can issue a ticket. They can administer a fine. They can, if the circumstances require it, take that child home to their parent. They have a range of options available to, to them to, that enable them to take effective action to enforce the absolute prohibition that now exists for people under the age of majority in their provincial jurisdictions to p purchase, possess, or consume cannabis. But they can do it in a newly proportional and effective way. They don't have to criminalize that child. They can take effective action to protect them. And this for, for kids is not just about enforcement, but it's also about education. And we have invested significantly and worked very closely with provinces, territories, health officials, teachers, doctors, and parents right across the country to ensure that kids can now be given factual, evidence-based information about the real harms that cannabis re can represent to them. And through the efforts of stricter enforcement, stricter regulations that restricts the access the kids will have to this drug and through public education, we believe that we can do a far better job of keeping the cannabis out of the hands of, of our kids. And at the same time, we also recognize that, that organized crime having profited in the billions, we, we begin the process today of displacing that illicit market. All of the tools and regulations that the police and enforcement authorities that the police currently have to deal with illegal production and distribution remain in effect. Illegal production and distribution remain serious criminal offenses. But today, for the first time, there is competition in the marketplace. For the first time, adult Canadians who choose to consume cannabis have a safer, lower risk, healthier and more socially responsible choice. They can choose to do this legally in this country today. And that will change. It will not change overnight, but it begins the important process. By continuing to enforce the laws of this country against those who illegally produce and, and distribute cannabis, and at the same time giving adult Canadians a safer and legitimate choice, we will begin to significantly reduce the impact of organized crime in our communities. We know that they profit in, in the neighborhood of approximately $8 billion a year in this criminal enterprise. And someone once suggested to me, if we can only take half of the market away from them in the first year, will that be enough? And I will tell you, I've fought organized crime my entire life in my previous occupation. And any opportunity to take $4 billion a year out of the pockets of organized crime is a good year's work. And so I think we're off to an excellent start. The government has also taken action to ensure 
that Indigenous peoples have access to the economic opportunities in the legal cannabis industry. We have worked very collaboratively and engaged with Indigenous communities and First Nations across the country. We have listened to their concerns with respect to access to the economic opportunities, the issues of, of how, how cannabis might be distributed, and their ability to, in, in, to establish and enforce regulations that will help keep their communities safe and protect their kids. We've also invested and worked with them very closely to ensure that health education products are available. In, in the languages spoken in Indigenous communities, but also in a, in a manner it's presented, which is culturally appropriate. And with respect to the issues of, of, of taxation and finances, it's part of an ongoing important engagement that is taking place between our, our country and the First Nations, a nation-to-nation -nation discussion on a new fiscal arrangement, which will include the, the taxation and revenues generated from the new cannabis industry. The new system, I believe, will do a better job of protecting our kids, and that is our first and most important priority. And by giving ad reg adult Canadians a regulated legal alternative, we believe that we can make our communities safer. We have established a new national tracking system, for example, that has been set up to, to, to monitor the high-level movements of the cannabis industry throughout the supply chain in order to, to immunize the new regime from the, from the influence of organized crime. We've established new transparency regulations and oversight, strict security controls to ensure that everyone participating in the new legal industry is not engaged in criminal activity. We have also been working very collaboratively with our international partners, and in particular with the United States, with, around issues of the border. And I know that there has been a number of, of people who have expressed anxiety, and we were very encouraged by the recent clarification that was issued by the Customs Border Patrol in the United States with respect to in, individuals who are involved in the legal cannabis industry in this country, and the fact that they would generally not be prohibited from coming into the United States unless, and, save and except, if they were going into the United States to engage in the marijuana industry, which of course is a legal in that country. We have also uh, want to ensure that every Canadian in, understands that though cannabis may be legal to possess in Canada for adults, it is, it is strictly prohibited to take any amount of cannabis across the border into the United States or into any other country. And conversely, it's illegal to bring cannabis from any other country into Canada. We have made arrangements and we've, we've sent out information to every household in Canada so the Canadians know the law. We've put up posters and, and, and billboards at every border crossing so that Canadians will not inadvertently find themselves in legal jeopardy. It's, it's very important Canadians know the law and when they present themselves at any border crossing with, with, with the intent of going into another country, they, they need to know that they need to present themselves in a responsible, respectful way, obeying the laws both of Canada and the jurisdiction that they intend to enter. I want to emphasize that this is a process that we have engaged in. We have been working diligently with the provinces, territories, municipalities, stakeholders, public health officials and law enforcement for over two years in preparation for the new legal framework that is put in place today. The provinces and territories have worked diligently with us to establish their own new regulatory regimes for the distribution of cannabis and also for its consumption. And we've been working with municipalities across the country to, to, to assist them in establishing the regulatory frameworks that they require in their jurisdiction and for their context to ensure that for adults who choose this cannabis, it can be done in a low risk, healthier and socially responsible way. I'd now like to, to ask my colleague, Minister Wilson-Raybould, to continue with her remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Blair. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here alongside uh, all of uh, my colleagues. Uh, a year and a half ago, I, on behalf of our government, was uh, pleased to introduce the Cannabis Act into the House of Commons and today uh, pleased to sit here and mark this historic day. And there is no question that uh, the world is watching Canada. This progressive policy fulfills our government's commitment, as Minister Blair has said, to taking cannabis out of the hands of youth and taking profits away from criminals and by protecting health and safety through strict regulation. The Cannabis Act has benefited from incredible work uh, and engagement, starting with the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, led by the amazing, the Honourable Anne McClellan. It was also enriched by a robust parliamentary process, as well as significant tens of thousands of pieces of feedback from countless Canadians. I also want to emphasize the important role that provinces and territories have played in helping to develop this law and in bringing forward their own 
related laws and regulations. They are indispensable partners in implementing this framework. We introduced the Cannabis Act because we know that strict prohibition does not work. Under the previous approach, it was easier for a teenager to gain access to a joint than a bottle of beer, while, as we said, criminals reap huge profits. Our new cannabis framework will protect our youth. To that end, serious penalties for anyone that tries to sell or provide cannabis to Canadians under the age of 18 um, have been introduced. These include the creation of two new corresponding criminal offences with maximum penalties of 14 years in jail. As of today, adults of legal age can purchase and possess cannabis from authorized retailers. They can also grow their own cannabis plants at home in some jurisdictions. Anyone who deviates from the law will be subject to a range of criminal penalties depending on the seriousness of the offence. And although cannabis is now legal for adults, Canadians should be mindful of their, the health effects and the serious consequences of drug-impaired driving. While impaired driving has been a crime in Canada for nearly 100 years, Canada has had one of the worst impaired driving records in the world among comparable countries. This is why I was very proud to introduce Bill C-46 as companion legislation to the Cannabis Act. With its passage, our government has put in place one of the strongest impaired driving regimes in the world, and we have provided law enforcement with additional tools and resources to combat drug and alcohol impaired driving. I continue to urge all Canadians to follow the law. If you are planning on drinking alcohol or consuming cannabis or drugs, you should not get behind the wheel of your car. The new legal framework that we promised and that we have put in place today will certainly better protect Canadians. Thank you, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Jeanette Petipot-Taylor. Merci beaucoup. Premièrement, je tiens à vous remercier tous et chacun d'entre vous d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici accompagnée de mes collègues, ministre Bill Blair, ministre Wilson-Raybould, ainsi que ministre Goodale, pour marquer l'entrée en vigueur de la loi sur le cannabis. Cette loi représente un changement important dans l'approche du Canada relativement au cannabis. Pendant les trois dernières années, nous nous sommes préparés à mettre en œuvre une approche axée sur mieux protéger la santé des Canadiens et des Canadiennes. La loi sur le cannabis qui entre en vigueur aujourd'hui remplace un système qui ne fonctionnait pas. Elle crée un cadre nécessaire pour garder le cannabis hors de la portée des jeunes et pour empêcher le crime organisé de n'en tirer profit. J'aimerais revenir aujourd'hui sur quelques éléments centraux de cette loi. Premièrement, nos jeunes. J'ai souvent répété que la consommation du cannabis présente le plus grand risque pour la santé chez nos jeunes et qu'ils sont particulièrement vulnérables aux effets du cannabis. Voilà pourquoi la loi sur le cannabis comporte tant de mesures pour mieux contrôler l'accès du cannabis et de mieux protéger nos jeunes. La loi prévoit de lourdes sanctions pénales pour ceux qui fournissent du cannabis à des jeunes de moins de 18 ans. Elle comprend aussi des restrictions en matière de promotion et de publicité et des restrictions concernant les produits, l'emballage, l'étiquetage qui peut attirer les jeunes. Pour la question de préparation, puisque souvent les jeunes nous demandent « êtes-vous prêts? » Aujourd'hui marque le début d'une transition ordonnée vers un nouveau régime juridique et nous sommes prêts. Nous sommes prêts à nous assurer que les producteurs autorisés font pousser et vendre du cannabis dont la qualité est contrôlée. Nous sommes prêts à continuer à recevoir les demandes de Canadiens qui souhaitent produire légalement du cannabis. Et nous sommes prêts à mettre en application les lois nouvelles, restrictions strictes définies par la loi. Nous sommes prêts pour notre travail, mais le, notre travail ne s'arrête pas ici. Le travail de Santé Canada avance afin de permettre d'ici un an la vente de produits comestibles à la base de cannabis et d'autres produits. Nous consulterons donc avec les Canadiens et les Canadiennes dans quelques mois au sujet de ce projet. Le gouvernement continuera aussi de soutenir la recherche sur le cannabis et de surveiller de très très près les répercussions de cette nouvelle loi. Puis, nous poursuivrons nos efforts pour informer le public. À cet effet, dans les derniers jours, tous les ménages du Canada ont reçu chez eux de l'information sur ce qu'il faut savoir à propos de la loi, notre carte postale. Nous lançons aujourd'hui la prochaine étape de notre campagne de sensibilisation et d'éducation. Cette campagne vise à continuer de répondre aux questions 
des Canadiens et des Canadiennes pour qu'ils puissent faire des choix éclairés. Dans tous les pays, provinces, territoires et les groupes autochtones et autres organismes ont contribué à donner de l'information cohérente fondée sur des preuves. Nous tenons à leur dire un gros merci. La nouvelle approche que le Canada prend relativement au cannabis est le résultat d'un dialogue national que nous avons lancé il y a près de trois ans. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons également que le gouvernement du Canada a l'intention d'offrir des ressources nécessaires pour permettre aux Canadiens et aux Canadiennes d'être éligibles à faire une demande de pardon sans frais tant que leur sentence est complétée. J'aimerais donc terminer en remerciant toutes ceux et celles qui ont pris part à l'élaboration de cette loi. Et je tiens à dire un merci spécial aux fonctionnaires qui ont travaillé d'arrache-pied durant les dernières trois ans pour nous aider à arriver à ce point aujourd'hui. Nous pourrons dorénavant mieux protéger la santé et la sécurité des gens. Je vous remercie. Et maintenant, je tourne la parole à M. le ministre Godel. Merci, Jeannette. Bonjour tout le monde. From the start, public safety has been at the forefront of our approach to dealing with cannabis. The overarching, or overarching goal of the new law is to be far more effective at keeping cannabis out of the hands of our kids and profits out of the hands of criminals. Canadian law enforcement agencies have been spending between two and three billion dollars every year trying to enforce the prohibition against cannabis. But consumption has gone up, not down, and organized crime has been raking in between seven and nine billion dollars annually in illegal cash. We simply have to do better. Canada's new Cannabis Act, now in force as of today, will make that possible. As Minister Blair has often said, as we go about changing a legal regime that has existed for nearly a century, there are many steps that must be taken in proper sequence. It is not a singular event, like flipping a switch. It is a process. Part of that process will involve at least one more piece of new legislation. As previously indicated, we will be proposing another new law to make things fairer for Canadians who have been previously convicted of simple possession of cannabis. As a general principle, removing the stigma of a criminal record for people who have served their sentence and then shown themselves to be law-abiding citizens enhances public safety for all Canadians. It's good public policy to remove roadblocks to the successful reintegration of previous offenders. That principle is even stronger. It becomes a matter of basic fairness when older laws from a previous era are changed. Now that the laws on cannabis have changed, individuals who previously acquired criminal records for simple possession of cannabis should be allowed to shed the burden and the stigma of that record. So today, I am announcing that the Government of Canada intends to present legislation which, when enacted, will allow these individuals to apply for a pardon as long as they have completed their sentence. There will be no further waiting period and no fee. This will eliminate what are disproportionate consequences and break down barriers, which could mean greater access to job opportunities ed and education, housing, and even the ability to simply volunteer for a charity in your local community. We will have more to say about the details of this process in coming weeks. My colleagues have laid out the details of the new Cannabis Act, that was Bill C-45, I'll turn most of my attention to Bill C-46, the new legislation on impaired driving which came into effect last summer. As Minister Wilson-Raybould points out, this new law gives Canada one of the world's strongest regimes against human carnage on our highways. It is supported by Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, the Canadian Automobile Association, and many others. But I want to make this point. The problem of drug-impaired driving is not new. It doesn't just spring into existence today. It's a problem that already exists, and it has existed for a very long time. Drug-impaired driving has been an offense under the criminal code since 1925. It kills people today. In fact, the percentage of Canadian drivers who are fatally injured in vehicle crashes and test positive for drugs 
already exceeds the percentage who test positive for alcohol. Whether we have a new cannabis law in Bill C-45 or not, it would still be smart public policy to have Bill C-46, to have stronger legal protections against impaired driving of all kinds, and to give law enforcement better tools to keep our roads safe. First, we are giving law enforcement the authority to use roadside oral fluid <laughs> testing devices as one more tool that can help police establish reasonable grounds to believe an offense has been committed and then consequently demand that a driver be examined before a drug recognition expert or submit to a blood test. One device has already been certified by the Minister of Justice. It's in fact already in use in more than 40 other countries, and other devices are in the pipeline for consideration. We are providing federal funding, a total of some $81 million, to help with the cost of acquiring these devices, and also to help train more drug recognition experts who operate in an export, expert capacity in police stations, and more frontline officers on patrol who conduct standard field sobriety testing at roadside. We're not starting from scratch. More than 13,000 officers are already trained to do that roadside detection work and more than 7,000 more will be trained over the next five years. Their curriculum now includes a new specific drug impairment component with a special emphasis on cannabis. At the same time, in addition to more than 800 existing drug recognition experts already on the job, we are funding training to add 500 more, and provinces and territories are expected to add even more, up to more than 1,500 altogether over the next five years. In Bill C-45, we also created several new offenses based on straightforward blood concentration levels that will be more objective to prove. Those are now in full force as of this past summer. The new laws and penalties are complemented by a robust public awareness campaign on social media, online, on television, and elsewhere to counter persistent myths and misconceptions about cannabis-impaired driving. The message is very simple. Don't drive high. If you are planning to use cannabis, including for medical purposes, do not get behind the wheel of a motor vehicle. If you do, your life may be destroyed in a heartbeat, not to mention the pain and suffering that you can impose upon others. I want to end by thanking the public safety community across this country, police officers, police chiefs, experts from a range of different backgrounds who've helped us to get us to where we are today. On behalf of all Canadians, our sincere gratitude for their collaboration and cooperation on this very important matter of public policy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, time for questions. Uh, we, our time is sort of short, and there are a lot of people who have questions, so if everyone can try to keep things concise, and I will be strict about follow one question, one follow-up. Uh, David Lundgren, Reuters. I just got a question for you. There's an election in a year's time. How would you quantify the political risk of this move a year ahead of an election? Because clearly not everyone supports what you're doing. Our assessment is that uh, uh, this new rearrangement of the law, a, a major transformation of the law, uh, is uh, broadly supported by uh, uh, by clearly the strong majority of, uh, of Canadians. Uh, and we have gone, as you know, to extraordinary lengths to engage all Canadians in the conversation about how to change the law and bring us to the point where we are today. Uh, there have been extensive consultations in every corner of the country, uh, largely uh, built around the, uh, the task force work that Anne McClellan uh, led, uh, but extending far beyond that. Uh, from uh, my perspective in public safety, we have uh, uh, consulted uh, extensively with uh, our provincial and territorial counterparts with law enforcement, with municipal organizations, to try to make sure that we were taking uh, all of the different angles and dimensions and perspectives about this major change into account, uh, including uh, indigenous communities. Uh, and uh, uh, our sense is that we have built a proposal here uh, that is very much in line 
with the uh, with the public policy preferences and instincts of the vast majority of Canadians. Secondly, how do you react to the comments of Premier Ford yesterday, who of course recently won here in Ontario the big majority saying that the government would force the stamp people's throats but they didn't want it and that you'd rush the process? Uh, well, it has not been rushed. It's very, been a very uh, long, extensive, inclusive uh, process. Uh, and it's a process that uh, uh, right across the country has been uh, uh, coordinated uh, by my colleague, uh, Minister Blair. Uh, he served as parliamentary secretary to both the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Health uh, and played a vital role in uh, coordinating the, uh, the communications. And uh, Bill might well be best placed to, uh, to comment on... Uh, the reaction from Premier Ford. Well, uh, I, w this has been a process that's been engaged upon for over two and a half years. Uh, we have worked very, very closely with the provinces and territories, and, and I will tell you that I have I have found a, 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 a broad consensus right across the country, um, at all three orders of government, that the current system was failing our kids and our communities and creating both an unsafe situation for the health and safety of our children, and the influence of organized crime. Um, all of us agreed that we needed to, to do better. Um, we've worked very, very closely in acknowledging and respecting the jurisdiction of the provinces uh, to, to establish their own regulations that were appropriate to their jurisdiction with respect to the distribution and, 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 and consumption of cannabis within their, their provincial and, and territorial jurisdictions. Um, we've, we've, they've been working collaboratively together. They've shared their experiences and, and learned from one another. Um, I, I would simply remind anyone who is concerned um, of the imperative that the, the, what was in place before was failing, failing badly. And, and that's, that's widely acknowledged. The new system gives us an opportunity to strictly regulate every aspect of the production distribution and consumption of cannabis and 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 I'm I'm confident that quite frankly we've done our job and we'll continue to do our job and the provinces and territories overwhelmingly have taken a very responsible approach to this and 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 a very careful and cautious approach to this which which we have advocated for and that they have certainly um, demonstrated um, I'm, I'm confident that going forward we will begin to see a reduction in the incidence of cannabis use among our kids and we'll begin to displace that illicit market and as a consequence our, our kids will be safer and healthier. Our communities will definitely be safer. Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Sur les pardons, question à qui veut la prendre. Um, quand précisément une personne qui a un casier judiciaire pour possession simple va le voir effacé? Donc j'aimerais avoir une précision sur l'échéancier pour que les casiers judiciaires soient effacés et pourquoi attendre qu'une peine soit purgée? The, uh, the law, of course, has to be changed in order to accomplish that. Uh, so uh, we will be introducing uh, legislation uh, very shortly. I would expect it uh, uh, to be in, uh, uh, in the House of Commons uh, for consideration before the end of the year. Uh, and uh, we hope that we will get good cooperation through the House of Commons to, to deal with this matter. As you will notice, there have been, there have been questions uh, coming from the opposition, uh, uh, encouraging a, a, a speedy approach to this. Uh, so I hope we can look forward to cooperation uh, in the House of Commons to get the legislation uh, uh, in place at, a, at an early date. We intend to keep the, the application process as simple as it can be. Uh, one of the complicating factors here is that uh, a large amount of the, the the paperwork that would have to be considered is uh, within uh, uh, provincial jurisdiction. Uh, so we will need to to uh, have cooperation in that regard. Uh, but we're we're going to keep the process as simple and straightforward as we can. As I mentioned, no fee uh, and no further waiting period once a sentence has been completed. Uh, unlike the existing law, which requires an additional number of years before you can apply for, uh, for a pardon, uh, in this case, for simple possession, uh, there will be no further waiting period uh, after the sentence has been served, and there will be no administrative fee that will be charged. Sur les produits comestibles, uh, quel est votre objectif? Quand espérez-vous avoir des produits comestibles sur les tablettes? Nous avons été très clairs à propos des produits comestibles que nous, nous nous donnons un an pour faire sûr que les règlements sont mis en place. Ça fait que Santé Canada continue à travailler d'arrache-pied pour s'assurer que nous pouvons euh, mettre sur pied les règlements comme tels. Et puis, nous nous avons donné jusqu'au 17 euh, octobre 2019 au plus tard. Okay. Christy Kirk, up the Canadian Press. 
Um, an editorial uh, published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal recently called cannabis legalization an uncontrolled national experiment. Is it? Well, I had the opportunity to spend some time with the president of the Canadian Medical Association just a few days ago. Uh, we talked about the new public health framework that, that's put in place and, quite frankly, the, the, the medical community, as represented by the Canadian Association of Public Health Officials, um, P Canadian Pediatric Society and the Canadian Medical Association has been very much involved in the development of these public health regulations. Um, they've also been very, very Im and important partners and collaborators in the development of new education materials. And I think it's really important that, that we now enter into um, a, a discussion about, I think, with evidence-based discussion about the health impacts of cannabis use, particularly among young people. This has been missing from this discussion for a very long time, where all we could tell kids was just say no. And frankly, too many of them were saying yes. And so uh, we've, we've, we've worked very closely with the, the medical community, even our task force had representation, the Chief Medical Officer of Public Health for British Columbia was a member of that task force. And so the, the medical community has been involved, and I appreciate there may be individuals, as that individual who wrote that article may have different opinions, but I will also suggest to you that there's an overwhelming consensus that the, the criminal prohibition had led to an unsafe situation for our kids and an unsafe environment in our communities, and that, that it needs to be done better, and this public health framework and strict regulatory approach is far more effective. And as, as I articulated earlier, for a kid found in possession of cannabis, previously the only recourse the police had was to charge them criminally. And that led to other consequences for that young person and not much good was done, achieved. But under these new regulations, so much more can be done. And so we've now created an environment where we can have a far more effective response to youth usage We've now been able to engage with parents, teachers. I've, I've been meeting with school boards, and they've told me when it was a criminal substance, it's tough to have a kid to talk with a kid about healthier, safer, lower risk choices for something that's a criminal act. But now, in a regulated environment, they can have more effective conversations that will improve the health of those kids. One thing, Minister Blair, that you've said and the government has repeatedly said is that this is uh, this is a move for the kids. It's going to keep pot out of the hands of kids, and even proponents who've been pushing for this move for decades say that that's bunk, that it's not actually going to keep it out of the hands of kids. So how do, how do you know what evidence is there that this is actually going to reduce those sky-high rates among young people? Yeah, you know, for, for the longest time, cannabis was the easiest substance we've asked kids. And, and there isn't a schoolyard, there isn't a neighborhood, there isn't a, a corner where a kid cannot acquire cannabis in this country. And, and, and the people that they're buying it from are motivated only by profit, don't care about the welfare of our kids, only about making money. And, and frankly, what they were selling to our kids, unregulated, untested, unknown purity or potency, and, and, and posed a significant risk to our children. And parents, teachers, doctors were restricted in their ability to have evidence-based, informed talks with kids about making better, safer, healthier choices. We've created the circumstances now that this can be dealt with in a far more effective way. Um, a far more evidence-based and informed way. We've, we've really taken this from the criminal justice system to, to look after our kids and given it to the health and, and education community, back to empowering parents, teachers, doctors, to be far more engaged in, in, in keeping our kids away from this drug. We've also been sharing information with kids so that they can have real information. It's astounding when we ask kids ab about the impact of this drug. They, they have so much misinformation, so much myth that needs to be overcome, and, and we need to provide them with evidence and facts from a source that they consider credible. The just say no and, and your brain in a frying pan, just or eggs in a frying pan, wasn't getting the message across. We've created an opportunity to have far more effective conversations with our kids. And as well, when we displace that illicit market motivated by, only by profit and replace it with a regulated industry that is subject to rules, governance, oversight, and accountability, there are real consequences new consequences for selling this drug to our kids. And, and coupled with greater restrictions on their access, better public education, and more engagement directly with kids, we're confident that that's a better approach than simply threatening them with a criminal record. Okay, Joyce Napier, CTV. Uh, good morning, ministers. I'm wondering um, <coughs> if uh, this bill that you intend to table to allow for these pardons for people with simple possession, are you doing that today? And if not, why not today? 
Uh, no, it will uh, it will come uh, as soon as it's ready to come, uh, but it will uh, it will not be uh, tabled today. The question is, why would it not be ready? You knew it would be today. The provinces, you asked the provinces to be ready, you asked the police forces, municipalities to be ready, and you know you want to table it, why not do it right away? Well, what we said was, as soon as the law changed, uh, that we would be in a position to uh, move forward on this important part of the equation, and that's what we're doing as of today. The law changed at midnight last night, uh, and we are uh, announcing this morning the first steps uh, toward uh, implementing the appropriate uh, pardon process for those with uh, uh, previous charges of simple possession. Peut-être une petite question en français. Euh, Est-ce que vous vous attendez avec la légalisation à ce que la consommation de cannabis augmente dans la population? Mais si on regarde l'expérience des États-Unis, nous voyons qu'effectivement, qu'il n'y a pas eu une augmentation de la consommation. Qu'est-ce que je peux dire quand même que nous reconnaissons clairement que le système actuel au Canada ne fonctionne pas? Encore une fois, nos jeunes sont parmi les plus grands consommateurs de cannabis dans tous les pays développés quand on regarde nos jeunes entre l'âge de 16 et 24 ans. Ça va être notre priorité, notre but avec notre loi sur le cannabis est de protéger nos jeunes. Puis effectivement, qu'est-ce que notre projet de loi fait aujourd'hui? Nous voulons s'assurer que nous pouvons euh, outiller nos jeunes de faire des bons choix éclairés. Et puis aussi, nous voulons restreindre l'accès du cannabis de nos jeunes et puis aussi de mettre un produit qui est réglementé pour les Canadiens qui sont de l'âge de majorité. S'il y a une augmentation de la consommation, est-ce que vous considérez qu'il s'agit d'un échec de cette loi qu'il faudra amender? Mais pour moi, qu'est-ce que... Pour dire que qu'est-ce que je vais considérer un succès de la loi, c'est sûr que ma priorité, c'est de m'assurer qu'il va y avoir un déclin dans le, le taux de consommation auprès des jeunes. C'est finalement ça qui serait une définition de succès pour moi. Mais à ce point-ci, nous reconnaissons que nos jeunes ont accès à un produit qui est non contrôlé, non réglementé. Ça veut qu'on veut s'assurer qu'on va mettre sur pied un régime qui va s'assurer qu'on peut restreindre l'accès aux jeunes et puis aussi que pour ceux qui sont de l'âge de majorité, qui vont avoir accès à un produit qui est réglementé. Si je... si, très rapidement, pour préciser, si jamais il y a une augmentation de la consommation des jeunes, est-ce que vous amendez la loi? Est-ce que vous la... Nous, nous avons toujours dit dès le début que le projet de notre loi aujourd'hui, euh, l'annonce de la loi aujourd'hui, c'est le début d'un nouveau régime. Et puis nous reconnaissons que ce n'est pas comme que mon ami M. Blair l'a toujours dit, euh, ce n'est pas un événement, c'est un processus. Et puis durant tout ce processus que nous allons continuer à évaluer euh, notre projet de loi de... de, de de toute façon. Hélène Buzetti, le devoir. Oui, j'aimerais revenir sur la question des pardons. Pourquoi faut-il attendre? Pourquoi est-ce qu'on offrira le pardon seulement pour les, les gens qui ont complété euh, leur sentence? Et est-ce qu'on donne instruction à ce que les causes qui sont en cours en ce moment soient abandonnées? In, in relation to uh, the, the pardon process, uh, it, uh, it applies uh, once a uh, once a sentence has been completed, that is the that is the uh, the, the principle upon which uh, the pardon structure is uh, is built. Uh, and bear in mind here, we're dealing with um, uh, only the offense of uh, of, of simple possession. Uh, so, in the vast majority of cases where there may be a a, a sentence still in the uh, process of being served, while there will not be very many of those cases. Uh, the uh, the timing involved is uh, uh, is uh, is relatively short, uh, but the principle of a pardon is that uh, uh, it applies. It becomes available uh, when a sentence has been completed. Um, normally, there is on top of that a waiting period. Uh, under the current law, that can be five years or or ten years or longer. Um, we are taking the position that for simple possession. Once the sentence has been completed, the, uh, the, there will be no further waiting period. An application can be made uh, immediately at that, at that point, and there will be no fee, whereas under the existing law, you would have to pay a fee of $631. So no fee, no waiting period, application uh, uh, immediately upon the, uh, the completion of, uh, of sentence. In terms of, uh, of court proceedings currently outstanding, uh, I would uh, turn to the Minister of Justice to, to comment on that. Well, thank you, Ralph. And, uh, 
court cases that are currently in process are under the purview or within the domain of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, which is an independent agency from government. Um, the Prosecution Service issued guidelines to their prosecutors in June of this year, guidelines that speak to, um, of course, the purpose of the federal legislation as articulated in in the legislation, but speak to whether or not there's a reasonable likelihood of conviction. If there is, then it goes to whether or not it's in um, the public interest to proceed. Uh, as uh, the Attorney General, I believe that prosecutors have the necessary discretion to determine whether or not to proceed with, with the prosecution, but that is entirely within uh, uh, their uh, domain. So oh, yours. Right, okay, we're no. almost out of time. She didn't get a follow-up. follow-up. Follow and she got three, so. She's, anyway, Men okay. Okay. She can get okay. a okay. And then Catherine Cullen, then I'm going to have to cut it off at that point because we're already five minutes past the point where the ministers were supposed so to go. I, I, I just want to know uh, if there's any instruction given to the, the United States said yesterday that even if you get a pardon, uh, it will not be necessarily erased from their files and they could still, you know, rely on this to refuse you access to their territory. So I'm just wondering whether or not there will be some measures taken to be sure that when you get a pardon, it's actually completely expunged or it disappears, or do you give instruct or are you consulting with the United States to, to make sure that they have up-to-date files so they cannot retrieve your old conviction for which you got a pardon? Uh, the the uh, the Americans determine their own uh, uh, processes and procedures. Uh, so far, in what they have said publicly, uh, either at the at the ministerial level to me directly or to to Minister Blair, uh, or through uh, senior officials that have been in contact, it would appear that uh, um, the American plan is to. Uh, uh, conduct themselves in a very in a very professional manner to make sure that uh, the Canadians are, are are properly treated and not uh, uh, unfairly discriminated against. Obviously, we'll be watching closely to uh, to ensure that the experience at the border is uh, is a good one. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, they can establish their own rules. We will make sure. Uh, that they know what the facts are on the Canadian side of the border. Uh, but the uh, uh, the Americans uh, are as are a sovereign nation in charge of their own border, just as we are a sovereign nation in charge of our border, uh, and we wouldn't expect them to tell us about what our border procedures should be. But uh, Bill, you probably have some further observations to make. About it. No, simply we've. I, I would concur. We've, we've been in discussions with those officials, and and I think it's it's the fact that a pardon has been obtained is a significant fresh start for Canadians, and that's why we, we're we're talking about it. Um, and and when they go to the border, the U.S. US officials also have the ability to take into account the fact that a, that a pardon, if they do happen to have an old record, that a pardon has been been granted in that regard. Um, again, I, I would encourage all Canadians to, who, who wish to enter, seek entry into any other country, including into the United States, that they present themselves in a responsible and honest way. It's an offense not to tell the truth. But if they, if they feel uncomfortable and, and don't wish to answer their questions, they have the ability not to incriminate themselves. They can always have the option of turning around and coming back into Canada. Okay, we're just about out of time. There's time for one last question. Catherine Collins, CBC. Minister Goodell, uh, further on pardon. So you have to put the law forward, the law has to pass, people have to apply, the applications have to be processed. If I understand correctly, there is a backlog in the pardon system. Someone who is listening to you today, who is, has been stigmatized in the way you suggested earlier, are they a year, five years, ten years from seeing a pardon? What, what, what would you say to them? Catherine, the critical point is... Uh, is uh, getting the legislation passed as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's what we will be focused upon to give us the legal framework to move forward. Um, we've said from the very beginning, we're undertaking here a fundamental transformation of a legal regime that has existed in Canada and has had consequences in Canada for more than a century. Uh, that is not a singular event. That is a process. Uh, we have made terrific progress on that process in the uh, relatively short span of time uh, since, uh, since our government began. We will continue moving forward step by step in a logical sequence to get this done right. 
This has to be accomplished in a way that is, is solid and achieves the ultimate result. We're moving with all due speed to get to where we need to be, uh, but we have to do it right, and we will take each logical step, one after the other after the other. NDP and other groups had called for expungement as if the crime had never happened. They say that that is what's fairest to the people who have been, uh, in some cases, minority groups unduly targeted, which your government acknowledges. Why, why not go that route? Uh, we have, we have uh, utilized the tool of expungement uh, in uh, uh, cases where there is a profound historical injustice that needed to be corrected. And that was obviously the case with our previous Bill C-66, uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the previous provisions in the criminal code that had uh, uh, imposed a very serious human rights injustice upon uh, the LGBTQ2 communities. Uh, the, uh, the, the laws with respect to, to cannabis that have existed historically, we believe are out of step with current mores and, and, uh, and, and views in Canada, uh, but are, are, are not of the same nature as the, the, the historic social injustice that was imposed uh, in relation to uh, uh, the LGBTQ2 community. So the, the difference here is the difference in the nature of the offence. Um, we also believe that, uh, that uh, pardons can be proceeded upon more quickly and with less expense. Uh, from from the point of view of the government and the cost of administration. So it can be faster, it can be uh, uh, more expeditious. Both would require legislation. Uh, we're presenting the legislation as, as rapidly as we can, uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, drawing the distinction with expungement, uh, which is reserved for cases of profound historical injustice where a charter rights violation was involved. Okay. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Et mes excuses à celui qui n'a pas eu une question. My apologies to those who didn't get a question.